Why has this woman consecrated her life, made a complete offering of her entire self for what seems like such thankless work? What is the mystery behind the outpouring of love and care she brings to people who can neither respond nor show their appreciation for her presence? While she loves without measure, who is loving and sustaining her? The vocation to religious life for women is the response to a call from God to be loved completely by Him and through Him to offer that love back to every human person. This life eternally satisfies all the desires of the feminine heart for infinite union, fruitfulness, security, and fulfillment. Lord, you have called me. Here I am. The call to the religious life is as personal as the woman who receives it. Through persons and events in the life of the church, a woman can discern this intimate call with a certainty that can be experienced and trusted. University professor Edith Stein, a Jewish philosopher, experienced a series of events that helped her discern God's call to the consecrated life. When a beloved colleague died during wartime, his widow asked Edith to come visit what had been their happy home. It was my first encounter with the cross and with the divine strength that inspires in those who carry it. At that moment, my unbelief was utterly crushed. The light of Christ poured into my heart, and because of this light, I desired to take the habit of Carmel. Dear sister, are you now resolved to unite yourself more closely to God by the bond of perpetual profession? I am so resolved. The Lord's call to the religious life is a call that can only be confirmed and pursued through a free ascent. Pope John Paul II stressed, Since he calls by name, his call always appeals to human freedom. Christ says, if you wish, and the response to this call is therefore a free choice. I've been a religious for 55 years. I suppose it started in the Catholic schools when I was being trained by the sisters and they had a great influence on me. Glory to God in the highest. And as a result of that, the desire to really help others, you know, to share with them the gifts I had and to learn from them. But I think the discernment went on from those first years when I saw the nuns at school, the sisters at school, and their example and inspiration were what really gave me a call, a sense of vocation. There is something about Carmelite spirituality that is very different those first monks on Mount Carmel were hermits. Although our Holy Mother adapted that to a Cenobitic life, meaning that they uh, did things together, she still emphasized the Eremitic life because uh, this was the emptiness that God could fill. A very virtuous, spirit-filled Carmelite. Transform us by the Spirit's grace. So I think when we came here, and started the hermitages, I think it made a tremendous difference in the prayer life of the sisters. So I think that the spirit of Carmel, that solitude, has a great advantage in bringing us back to the real aim of our life, which is this intimacy with God. When you do make your final profession, you do have that sense that this is forever. With my sisters as witnesses, into your hands, Reverend Mother Virginia Marie, vow to Almighty God forever. I was so sure. Now, I, not everyone isn't. 
and especially today when there are so many more options for people, it's, I think it's a much harder discernment. But mine was really very simple. One thing that has supported me and has guided me through all my life has been the idea that Christ is in everyone. I think that has probably brought more peace into my life than just about anything else. I think the greatest happiness comes simply from that intimacy with Christ that develops and grows and, and you know, the mystery of God becomes your all-absorbing occupation. The vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience free a woman from any attachments that might keep her from receiving the fullness of the Lord's life and love. Paradoxically, this heroic and often demanding way of life can lead religious women to the fullness of human happiness and perfection. Are you resolved, with the help of God, to undertake that life of perfect chastity, obedience, and poverty chosen for themselves by Christ our Lord and His Virgin Mother, and to persevere in it forever? I am so resolved. When Claire encountered Francis in the piazzas of Assisi, Italy, she was so moved by his way of life in the church that she came to see him and his followers in the dead of night. Exchanging her rich clothing for a rough cloak, she had her hair cut and embraced the Franciscan rule of poverty, chastity, and obedience. When you have loved Christ, you shall be chaste. When you have touched him, you shall become pure. When you have accepted him, you shall be a virgin. Claire's horrified family thought she was throwing away a prosperous future as the wife of a wealthy man. But for Claire, consecration was the ultimate expression of life with an even more extraordinary bridegroom. Religious life is really based on the words of Jesus, follow me. A religious is called to imitate the life of Jesus Christ as he lived it on earth. Breathe on me, breath of God. Some of the ways that make this community a significant and wonderful reality include the strong common prayer life that we have together as well as personal individual prayer. The evangelical councils lived in a community life with prayer and the support of all that it helps me be free from certain things that are very good in themselves but in this particular life there's a way that I'm freed from those things so I can be free for him and for the church. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This the main point is not the evangelical councils, they're a means to an end. The main point is the person of Jesus, the living person of Jesus Christ, as Lord, as Savior. There's a line in the Vatican document, Gaudium et Spes, that Pope John Paul II quoted more frequently than any other, it seems. It talks about the self-gift as a way of living that is so fulfilling. It says something like, only with a sincere gift of oneself can one find oneself truly can one come to self-fulfillment? And I have come to know that's true. I believe that, I've experienced that, and I think that's what it's all about. The consecrated woman shows that it is not only possible to have a rich and fascinating life in companionship with the living God, but that this life is the eternal destiny of every human person. While those who follow the evangelical councils seek holiness for themselves, 
they propose, so to speak, a spiritual therapy for humanity because they reject the idolatry of anything created and in a certain way the they make God. visible the living God. The Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, with boundless love you created the human family through your word in the Holy Spirit and lifted it up into communion with yourself. You make the human family your bride, radiant with your own likeness, adorned with the gift of everlasting life. I thought about being a religious when I was in grade school. What really attracted me to this congregation and to religious life was devotion to the Sacred Heart, which is the core of our congregation. Um, the compassion of Christ, the putting a human face of Christ for others who obviously in our world today are very much in need of compassion and love and healing. Uh, New York City is definitely an experience. Uh, I'm not originally from New York City, but I've always liked the city. I've always found the energy and I've always found the vibrancy um, quite life-giving. I love to look out over the city. I love to imagine the people in the apartments, in the businesses, in the stores, walking on the street. Because basically they're just like me. They have hopes, they have dreams, they have good days, they have bad days. And to be able to pray for them, uh, to be able to be a part of that humanity that we're all a part of, uh, it's an apostolate in a sense of the people that I can't reach personally, that I can reach them with my prayers. Almost 25 years ago, I made vows, and I remember on that day, someone told me, you know, today you make vows, someday your vows are going to make you, and I have realized that that is very true. Now, it's a hinge joint, like a door. The religious vows themselves point to an eschatological mystery. They point to the life beyond. They point to how someday we will all be living. So the very essence of religious life is not for this world. The very essence of religious life points to a reality that is beyond this world, when the kingdom will be fulfilled. We have a piece of the kingdom now, um, and part of that I live out in imitation of Christ, in poverty, in chastity, in obedience. But it points to a bigger reality, something that is beyond who we are, and certainly taken up in the mystery of God. You're all studying for right? Yeah, <laughs> There's a confidence that I have when I'm following God's will, that He is accompanying me on the way. I don't know where the road is going to lead, but I know as long as I journey with Him that in the end, there will be the reward, there will be the joy, there will be the eternal union. I can't wait. <laughs> the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that in the consecrated life, Christ's faithful, moved by the Holy Spirit, propose to follow Christ more nearly, to signify and proclaim in the church the glory of the world to come. Receive this ring, for you are betrothed to the eternal King. Keep faith with your bridegroom, so that you may come to the wedding feast of eternal joy. Amen. The bond between a consecrated woman and her Redeemer brings a new creativity into the world. This fruitfulness is manifested both in the generous work she is called to do and in the intense way she is called to love. One of my acquaintances, putting her opinion baldly, asked me what made me choose such a dirty occupation. In the 19th century, Rose Hawthorne daughter of author Nathaniel Hawthorne, left her society lifestyle for a simpler life of prayer. Rose began to care for abandoned people with cancer, a disease thought at the time to be contagious. I have set out to love everyone and to try to make them love each other. A century later, Author Flannery O'Connor saw the glory of God still present in Rose's Dominican Hawthorne nuns. She called them 
Women who are shocked at nothing and who love life so much that they spend their own lives making comfortable those who have been pronounced incurable of cancer. Knowing oneself called to religious life and living religious life is knowing oneself beloved by God. And it's something that we can't keep to ourselves. There's so much fun going together to, to gather them up. We have a great desire to share what the effects of that love are with others. And sometimes we're even placed in the position by God to manifest that love. What happened to you on the glucophage? We have several Sisters of Mercy who are physicians in internal medicine, family practice, surgery, psychiatry. And they're ministering to their patients, obviously at a very high level professionally, but bringing the dimension of the divine physician to those patients. And then we'll take the stitches out next week. The joy that we find with each other in whether it be work or recreation within the community gives us a joy that not only carries over into any other activity within the house but also to what we do outside the house so that that joy is a great cause of a fruitfulness. I am a member of the body of Christ and what can I do for the rest of the body? When we take perpetual vows of poverty, chastity, obedience, and in our community a fourth vow of service to the poor, sick, and ignorant, I am saying yes to the life that Christ led. And that to me gives the greatest freedom. It gives me great joy when I see the effects of myself as a religious woman in the world. But I also have to believe in faith when I don't see effects, that if I am being faithful, as Jesus has said, he will always remain faithful. And that is a great source of consolation and encouragement. The fruitfulness of the consecrated woman includes a profound capacity for communion with her sisters and with every other human person. I confirm that you are now one with us as members of this religious community sharing all things in common with us, now and in the future. When Catherine McCauley built a House of Mercy in Dublin, Ireland, within two years, over 100 women joined her mission to care for homeless and uneducated women and children. The blessing of unity still dwells amongst us, and oh, what a blessing! All laugh and play together, not one cold, stiff soul appears. This is the spirit of the order, indeed the true spirit of mercy flowing on us. The vocation to religious life is probably the greatest gift that God could give us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a gift. It's not something that, that you really choose. It's He who's chosen you. It's just up to you to respond to His choice. It's a life of love. It's a school of love, the religious life. It's where we learn to accept the love of God for us um, as fully as we can, and then we learn to give it out to others. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Something that I've learned in the short time that I've been in religious life is that the more you get to know Christ in prayer and the more you accept Him in your life, the more you can see Him reflected in the eyes of those around you, especially in those who are most vulnerable. And for us, those are our residents. They give me great joy because they teach me what it means to live. They teach me how to, to age gracefully. They teach me how to enjoy life at every moment. They teach me what it means to have dignity, even in the most frail state. Are you ready to take a bite? To see one of their smiles, to see them say, hello sister, you know, or call you their little sister, um, really is probably the greatest reward. And that spurs you on 
to really try to be better, to try to, you know, to serve them ever more wholeheartedly. You know, our generation is probably the one that they say is most apt to volunteer. So for us to serve the homeless or to, you know, build houses or something concrete is, is very easy in a sense. But when it comes to surrendering your will to God's will in His design for you in a specific vocation, um, it's quite challenging. It calls for a lot of courage, um, a lot of calling on the Holy Spirit, a lot of a deep prayer life. It calls for openness and trust among, you know, your community. It calls for, um, it calls for the grace of God, really. I've heard a lot about those victory gardens. Did all of you have one? You know, a lot of people think that holiness is really hard, but I think they're thinking of all these heroic saints and, you know, all these high ideals, and you have to pray certain prayers and look a certain way and walk a certain way and say certain things. Teresa, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But really, I think when you come down to it, holiness is trying to be open to the Lord trying to unite yourself to His will and then be able to give of yourself. The body of Christ. Amen. And I think that's the whole idea of, of holiness, that gift of self. That's four tomatoes on this one plant. How about that, Catherine? In religious life, a woman freely and fully offers herself to God as a gift for His purposes and plans. In this, she follows the way of Jesus Christ, who obediently gave his own life and will to God the Father on the cross. Catherine Drexel generously gave the sincere gift of her whole life to Christ in service to Native and African Americans. She instructed her sisters to focus on the Eucharist as the source of their life and love. The Eucharist is the continuation of the Incarnation Arise from the Holy Communion to find Him in the people. Remember this sister of ours who has left all things for your sake so that she may find you in all things and by forgetting self, serve the needs of all. When I was a junior in high school, I first felt called to the religious life. I was taught by the Dominican sisters from Nashville and I saw they had an incredible joy in the way they lived their life, that they were deeply in love with Christ and very faithful servants of the church. Because with the Lord there is mercy. The consecrated life is a rare vocation. It's not one that most follow, but it's very freeing in that it enables us to give our whole hearts, our whole energy to serving the Lord and it helps us to point others in that direction. St. Cecilia, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I love working with young people. I love teaching. I've spent most of my teaching working with junior high and high school age students, so teenagers. And they're at a very exciting time in their life, a time when they're making a lot of changes. They're facing a lot of challenges. So God created you to share in the exchange of love that exists within the Trinity. And I feel like in some ways that the teaching I can bring them, especially when it's rooted in the gospel of Jesus, it can bring them a truth that can set them free. Sometimes maybe you see the sisters at school and um, our lives are very different, our personalities are very different, but what unites us together is the bond we have in Christ. For us in religious life, Community is the family through which we serve Christ and the church. And it's so much easier to seek union with God when we're in union with others. The community gives us the strength to do what we cannot do on our own. You know, many religious communities follow the rule of St. Augustine, and we do too. And it says in the rule, the first purpose for what you have been gathered together is that you dwell in unity in the house and that you have but one heart and one soul in God. If we were just living on the natural level, we may be able to get along for a few years, maybe a few months, but when we're rooted in Christ, 
That is a bond that we can live our whole life long. Your story, and when you were saying about how you wanted to be in the neighborhood. You know, you can only live in community if you have mercy and forgiveness. Because even though I live with a community of sisters who are all striving to be holy and striving to give their lives to Christ sincerely, we're only on the journey. We're not there yet. And so, whether it's my own impatience or tiredness or some form of selfishness that can get in the way of really giving in community, the power to forgive one another, the power to welcome one another and accept one another flows from the grace of God. We still maintain our individuality. We still have the unique gifts God gave us, and we bring those gifts to bear on whatever we're asked to do. But there is a fundamental unity. We shouldn't focus too much on ourselves. God is the one who calls, and God is the one who gives us the grace to say yes to that call. When I was asserting my vocation, the superior of our community said to me, look into your heart and what is deepest there, follow it. And for me, when, when I looked deepest, it was Christ saying, I want you to be all mine. I had many plans for my life, and they weren't in this direction. And I'm so happy that God said to me, I call you, I choose you. The scriptures say, perfect love casts out fear. And when we realize how much we've been loved by Christ, it makes it easy for us to love Him in return, and simply to say yes. In describing her own vocation, Mother Teresa of Calcutta said of this beautiful way of human life. Vocation is simply a call to belong totally to Christ with a conviction that nothing can separate me from His love. Vocation is an invitation to be in love with God and to prove that love. How do I love God? How do I prove my love for God? By doing beautifully the work I have been given to do by doing simply that which God has entrusted to me, in whatever form it may take. During his installation, Pope Benedict XVI proclaimed this truth to the world. If we let Christ enter fully into our lives, if we open ourselves totally to Him, we lose nothing, absolutely nothing, of what makes life free, beautiful, and great. And so, with strength and conviction, I say to you, dear young people, do not be afraid of Christ. He takes nothing away, and He gives you everything. When we give ourselves to Him, we receive a hundredfold in return. May He make those bonds with which He has bound you to Christ on earth and your forever in heavenly love. Amen. And may the peace and blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.